I'm Robert Breaker, and in Honduras I made a video entitled The Truth and the History About the Jehovah Witnesses, and I did it in Spanish only. Uh, that video I put on YouTube, and many people that have seen it in Spanish said, Brother Breaker, you've got to do that video in English. Well, I spent some time translating everything that I had in Spanish into English, and these are the slides in English. Now let me briefly say quickly before I begin this slideshow, Many of the sources that I found and I used were from English, so I had to translate from English into Spanish. And then now, in order to do this in English, I had to translate back into English from the Spanish. So I back translated from the Spanish. So if you ever find some of these sources that I'm quoting here and they read a little bit differently with uh, you know, a couple of different words, that's why. I have translated first into Spanish, now I'm translating back into English in order to do this slideshow. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to take you to the history and the truth about the Jehovah Witness movement, also known as the Watchtower. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you their history, who they are, where they come from. This is a so-called Christian denomination in the world today that many people look at and say, is that even, is that, is that Christian? So let's look at that and see if this is indeed a Christian denomination or if this is rather a cult. Now, first of all, the Bible says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. My name is Robert Breaker, and I'm a missionary evangelist doing just that. I focus on preaching the gospel of salvation, on how to be saved. But I also try to show people the truth from the Bible, about what the Bible says, and I also want to expose false religious organizations and warn you about them. So that's what we'll do today. The Bible commands me, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering. and look at that last word, doctrine. Doctrine is so important. We want to make sure that we go to the scriptures, the true word of God, the King James Bible, and have the right doctrine. Now why should we have the right doctrine? But because in 2 Timothy 4.3 it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. There will be a time when there will be some people that don't want sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So there will be a time, according to the Bible, when teachers will arise and begin to preach things that aren't what the Bible teaches. When is that time? Well, I believe that's in the last days. And I believe we are in these last days of today. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 4, 4, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. Someone's going to turn away their ears from the truth and be turned into a fable or a made-up story or a lie. So what we're going to do today, we're going to look at this organization that calls themselves the Jehovah Witnesses. We're going to put them in the balance and weigh them against the Bible and see is what they teach what the Bible teaches. Who are the Jehovah Witnesses? The Jehovah Witnesses are found in New York City. This is what they call themselves, the Watchtower. It almost looks like an old, uh, an old uh, Middle Ages type of a castle building where they are centered in their main headquarters in New York City. What they are officially is they call themselves the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And there's their big, huge building in New York. Isn't it rather strange, though? that they call their organization a society rather than a church. You know, they claim to be Christians and a Christian denomination, but they never once refer to their organization as a church. It's always called a society. Why is that? That's quite interesting, isn't it? The Bible says, and Jesus is speaking, He says, I shall say to thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus is speaking to Peter and says, upon me, because He says this rock, and Jesus is the rock. He says, upon me, I'm the rock, I'm going to build my church. Jesus never said, I'm going to build my own society. <laughs> he said, church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So why do they call themselves a society rather than a church? If you go to a Jehovah Witness uh, building where they meet, they call their buildings a kingdom hall. They don't call it the Church of Jehovah Witnesses. They call it the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah Witnesses. Why do they not ever refer to their organization as a church? Why do they always call it a society? And why do they claim to, be, to meet in a hall? 
Everywhere you go, you'll find the Jehovah Witness denomination. And always, never does it say the, the Jehovah Witness Church. It always says the Jehovah Witness Kingdom Hall. Almost sounds like some sort of secret society with their little meeting hall, doesn't it? Like the Elks Club, they have a hall. <laughs> But what is this? Well, if you look in Spanish, what's interesting to me, in Spanish, they don't call it the Kingdom Hall, they don't call it a church, they call it the Salon. Salon de Reino de Testigo de Jehová. The Salon. The Salon in Spanish. Salon. What is a Salon? <laughs> Why, well, a Salon is where you go to get a haircut. And as we get into this study of the Jehovah Witness movements, you know what we find is we find that this organization that never refers to itself as a church cuts up the Bible and cuts up the true doctrine of the scriptures. Whatever they are, they're not a church. The Jehovah Witnesses are not a church, and they don't have churches. They meet in halls. So if they're not a church, what are they? Well, they're a secret society with their own meeting halls, a country club, if you will, a gathering place like the Elks Lodge or the Grand Poobahs. They are a secret society. What we're going to study today, let me just give you a brief outline of what we're going to go into. We're going to study, first of all, the history of this religious organization or society. Remember, I can't call it a church because it's not. It's a society. We're going to look at the doctrines of this society and what they believe exactly. Then we're going to look at the testimony of others about the Jehovah Witness or the Watchtower Society. I'm going to go into detail as much as I can about what these what this organization is. So let's begin with the history of the Jehovah Witnesses. The Watchtower Society started with Charles Taze Russell, who lived from 1852 to 1960. And here's Mr. Russell as a young man, and here's Mr. Russell as an older man. I guess his beard filled in a little bit. Not quite as good as mine, but uh, he's got himself a beard there. And this is Mr. Tuss, uh, Taze Russell. Charles Taze Russell was born on February 16, 1852, in Allegheny, Pennsylvania. This is Mr. Russell. Now, it's important to note that from this region where he was born, in Allegheny, Pennsylvania, came a lot of occult practices. There was a lot of occultism. Even the Unitarian movement was centered around this area, which denied much of the Bible. So it's interesting that he comes from a hotbed of anti-biblical uh, teachings, a place where a lot of cults were founded and came from. Another man named Joseph Smith came from around that area. And I will talk about him eventually as we look at the truth about the Mormons. But today we're going to focus in on Russell. Now when I was in Honduras, I found this book, The Dictionary of the Beliefs, Religion, Sects, and Occult. And unfortunately, this book isn't in English, but I looked up in this book, and this book talked about this Charles Russell fellow. And so I translated this into English for us to see what this book, and I quote from this book, says about Charles Russell. Charles Taze Russell was born in Allegheny. Of course, that's in Pennsylvania. He grew up in a hotbed of Presbyterianism. Russell decided that Presbyterianism was not what he was looking for. In particular, the Calvinist doctrine of predestination and eternal punishment greatly bothered him. At age 17, Russell left Christianity and declared himself a skeptic. Russell concluded that his faith in the creeds of human churches were no longer valid. So at, eight, at 17 years old, close to 18, Mr. Russell said, that's it, I'm out. I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in Christianity. I, I'm a skeptic. I want nothing to do with Christianity. I quote again from this same book. He said that all the religions were corrupt and apostate. Russell continued on in skepticism, skepticism of religion until about the year 1870 when he stumbled upon a group of Seventh-day Adventists guided by Jonah Wendell. This pastor's name was Jonah Wendell. Later, Russell wrote... wrote Although his exposition of the scriptures were not completely clear, and although it was far away from what we enjoy today, it was by God's direction sufficient to reestablish, now look at this, this is a direct quote from Mr. Russell, my weakened faith in the divine inspiration of the Bible. So he confesses that he didn't have much faith in the Bible. And he confessed that he was a skeptic. Well, as we continue here, as we read, he said he went to the Adventists, so who were the Adventists? He began going back to the Adventists. 
Well, before we continue our study on who are the Jehovah Witnesses or the Watchtower Society, we must look at this sect called the Seventh-day Adventists, because Charles Russell took a lot of his doctrine from them, especially about his teaching of the world coming to an end in 1914. So who are the Seventh-day Adventists? Well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, had a woman preacher, Ellen J. White. Is that, is that what the Bible says? I mean, should we go to any religion that has a woman in charge? Should a woman be a teacher of the Bible? Does the Bible tell us about that? Well, as a matter of fact, it does. The Apostle Paul says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So what are you doing, Mr. Russell? First you're a skeptic, and you say, I don't believe the Bible. Now you're going to a place where a woman's in charge? And the Bible says the woman shouldn't be the one that's teaching the Bible? So, Mr. Russell began to go to this religion that had a woman teacher. Now why does the Bible say that a woman should not be a teacher of the Bible? Well, we continue reading the Bible. The Bible itself says, For Adam was first born, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the tr transgression. Who was it that, that uh, came to deceive Adam and Eve? Why, it was the serpent. It was Satan. And who did he go to? The woman. He went to deceive the woman. So here is a woman that was the director of this place. So be very careful with women who say they are preachers or teachers of the Bible. A lot of times they are easily deceived, and they shouldn't be preachers or teachers anyway. And who deceives them? Well, Satan. Satan can deceive a woman more easily than a man. Now, who are the Adventists? Well, we look at the Bible, and here it is, this book in Spanish again. I quote from it. The Seventh-day Adventists. It says, the Seventh-day Adventists are a Christian denomination that started in 1863, started by a group of ex-Millerites. All right? Who are the Millerites? You start running down the rabbit trail of the teachings and studying about the Jehovah Witnesses, and it takes you to the Seventh-day Adventists. And then it takes you to the Millerites. Who are these Millerites? Well, I go to the same book in Spanish, and here it is. It tells us what the Millerite movement is. So let me translate that to English. Boy, that was fast. It says, the Millerite movement... A movement that took the name of William Miller, a man that was living or born in 1782 and lived until 1849. He was a farmer from New York that prophesied of the second coming of Christ. Miller had a great number of followers in his time, especially after announcing specific dates for the coming of Christ. Basing his doctrines in Bible prophecy, he came to the conclusion that the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus would be between the 21st of March of 1843 and the 21st of March of 1844. So, this Miller man predicted 1844 would be the end of the world and when Jesus Christ came. Well, it didn't happen. <laughs> when it didn't happen, his new calculations predicted the date of the 22nd of October, of 1844 for the end of the world. And what happened? It didn't happen. When his second prediction didn't happen, not coming to pass, many left him feeling completely deceived. Yeah, and rightly so. So this man was a date setter and he set a false date. Here we go again in the same book. And this book tells us that he, he set these dates of when he thought that the Lord would come back. So he prophesied the date of Jesus coming twice. And guess what? He was wrong two times. Twice he said, Jesus is coming on such and such a day, and twice he was wrong. Well, what does the Bible say about someone like that, that makes a prophecy that doesn't come to pass? Well, what does the Bible say? Well, in Deuteronomy 18.20 it says, But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, even that prophet shall die. Now, this is Old Testament. We're not in the Old Testament today, but if we were, boy, that Miller guy would be dead. Today we're under an age of grace, so God has grace. But what do we do when somebody lies to us? Well, we should say, yeah, yeah, whatever. And rightly so, many people left because the man made a false prophecy or a false prediction. Again, the Bible tells us, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. Well, who spoke? Did Miller speak or did the Lord Jehovah speak through him? Obviously it was the Miller man, and he wasn't speaking the words of God. He made up his own little idea of when the Lord would come back, and he was wrong. 
So when the prophecy of Miller did not come to pass, another Adventist named Nelson Barber began preaching this, and this became the doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They said in 1799, that date marked the date of the beginning of the time of the end. And they said that 1874, I guess 1830-something wasn't the date, so they said 1874, well, that's the date of the invisible coming of Jesus. And then they said 1914, that will be the date for the end of the world. Dun, dun, dun! Well, what happened? <laughs> Did the world end in, in uh, those times? No. But this Charles Russell man had gotten into the Seventh-day Adventists. And he began to listen to those teachings, and he believed those teachings of when the end of the world would be. He believed it was 1914. And so he began to accept those teachings, and they had a great impact on his life. In fact, Mr. Russell, the founder of the Watchtower Society, the founder of the Jehovah Witnesses, predicted that 1914 would be the end of the world. He, too, became a prophet, and he prophesied, the end of the world will be 1914. So let's look at this in summary. Let me summarize this first part of this teaching. First of all, Mr. Russell learned his doctrine from the Adventists. The Adventists came from the Millerite sect, which later became the Seventh-day Adventist sect under the leadership of Mrs. White. Both sects said that the end of the world would be 1914. So there's the connection. The Adventists said 1914. Mr. Russell learned from the Adventists, thinking that 1914 would be the end of the world, so he set the date as 1914 for the end of the world when he began his own religion, or his own denomination, the Watchtower Society. So thinking that the world would soon end in 1914, Mr. Charles Taze Russell closed his business and started printing tracts. Mr. Russell then wrote a lot of literature. Here's Mr. Russell at his desk. He became an author and began to write book after book after book. And he claimed to be a teacher of the Bible, which is interesting. It wasn't much time after he declared himself a skeptic and then supposedly came back to religion. But his books are known as Studies in the Scriptures. Maybe you've seen some of Mr. Russell's books. He wrote many, many books. Here's what Mr. Russell said about his books. Let's, let's see what this fellow says about his own books. He says, no one can understand the Bible without the help of these books. And reading the Bible without them on your own will lead to spiritual darkness. <laughs> what? You're a little bit full of yourself, aren't you, mister? Telling people they can only understand the Bible if they get your books? Sounds like somebody's trying to sell his books, is what it sounds like to me. What? Are you serious? Are you telling me that I can't understand the scriptures without you and your books? Yep, that's what Mr. Russell said. What does the Bible say about that? Well, the Bible says, knowing that this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. You see, what happened is this man wanted to interpret the Bible on his own. And so he had what we call private interpretation. And he says, this is what I think the Bible says. Now buy my book so you can learn what I believe. <laughs> no thanks. No thanks. You see, the Bible says what it means and means what it says. In fact, I don't need anyone. I don't need a man to tell me what the Bible says. I can read the Bible for myself and find out what it says. And the Bible teaches us that it's the Holy Spirit that guides us, not Charles Taze Russell. The Bible tells us that the Spirit of God is the one that teaches us the Bible. We read in John 16, 13, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, like Mr. Russell did. <laughs> the Holy Spirit shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever ye shall hear, or he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. To understand the Bible, the first thing you need is to be saved. You see, you can't understand the Bible unless you're saved, because the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit inside of a believer is what teaches them the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. In order to understand the Bible, you should be saved. You should have the Holy Spirit of God. Well, how about it, Mr. Charles Taze Russell? Were you saved? Were you a Christian man? There exists no record anywhere 
of any of his writings, and he wrote so many writings, we cannot find one example where Mr. Russell ever said, now here's how I got saved. You would think if the man was a Christian and he was truly saved, he would have written down his testimony of how he got saved. But it doesn't exist. Nowhere does it say where he came to Jesus Christ as his Savior. Yet Mr. Russell, Russell published many tracts and pamphlets. He devoted his life to printing all these pamphlets in which he was writing about what he thought the Bible said. In fact, he started a magazine called the Zion's Watchtower. This is his Watchtower magazine. It's still around today. Why, from way, way, way back then, even to today, this magazine is still being written. It's called the Watchtower. You can still get a copy of the Watchtower, and it comes out, I guess, every month, every couple of months. They continue to print a magazine, and it all started way back there with Mr. Charles Taze Russell. So Mr. Russell wrote a vast quantity of literature. But if he didn't have the Holy Spirit guiding him, who could it have been guiding him in his Bible studies? Well, 1 Timothy 4.1 warns us about the last days. And remember, he said he thought it was the end of the world or the last days, and it would be in 1914. Well, the Bible says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So in the last days, there's going to be some evil, unclean spirits and devils going around teaching people false doctrine. Well, could that have been what happened to Mr. Russell? Are we in the latter times? Yes, this guy said, yeah, the last days are going to be 1914. That's going to be the end. So do we look at this Charles Russell man as a man who was truly a prophet of God that taught the truth? Or, according to the scriptures, do we look at the man as possibly a guy who was guided by demons to form a false doctrine in the last days? Let's look at this. Let's go more into this. Look at this. This is uh, his magazine, Watchtower. Look here on the front what you see in his magazine. When he first began printing his magazine, he put a cross and a crown and around it a sun. But notice how the cross isn't standing erect or upright. It's a cross that's fallen down. Why would he print a fallen cross with a crown around it? Where does that come from? The cross and the crown symbol is a well-known symbol in occultism. So if indeed this man was led by demons, then that would explain his occultic symbolism. Let me show you this. Here's a book called Halloween and Satanism by these folks here. And there are many different symbols that witches use in their occult practices. And you know, if you look at the witch's symbols, I take this from page 88 of this book, one of the symbols that witches use is they love to use a cross and a crown. Hmm, interesting. So there's your cross with a crown. What did Mr. Russell use? A cross with a crown. So was Mr. Charles Russell an occultist? We need to ask that question. Was Mr. Charles Taze Russell into the occult? Here's Mr. Russell as a young man, but here he is as an older gentleman, an older man. Now there's a, a famous author named Fritz Springmeier. And Fritz Springmeier told, as he gave a, a speech, and he also wrote a book called Bloodlines of the Illuminati, and he tells us that from his investigation and his study, Charles Russell was indeed a member of a secret society. He was a member of the Knights Templar. Huh. So here he is dressed in his regalia. Remember, it's called the Watchtower Society, not a church. Here's Mr. Russell as an older man. And you can tell that's the same man that's dressed up here in his regalia of his secret society. What is his secret society of which he was a part. Well, Fritz Springmeier tells us that Charles Taze Russell was a Templar, a Knights Templar. Okay, now we got to go off on another rabbit trail. Who were the Knights Templar? <laughs> well, let's find out. Here are the history of the Knights Templar. The Order of the Templars was found in, founded in the year 1118 A.D. by Hugh de Payens, Godfrey de Saint Aldemar, and seven other knights whose names we don't know. It was a order. It was a secret society. This, of course, comes from the history of masonry by Mackey. Here's the seal of the Templars. It is a red 
cross. As you can see up there, also is a red cross. So the Templars had this red cross. Now the Knights Templars were Catholics in the Crusades who were judged by the Pope and killed, literally put to death, for being accused of worshiping, guess who? Baphomet or Satan. So here you have the different orders of the Catholics during the Middle Ages and the Crusades. Here's the one with the red cross. And his order was the order that was put to death by the Pope for worshiping that guy. Who is that guy? Well, anyone in the occult will tell you that's Lucifer, that's Satan, that's Baphomet. So wait a minute. This Charles Taze Russell was a member of a Templar order and an order that... History, history tells us worships Baphomet. Above is the Templar Church in, the, in, in Europe, made famous in the book and the movie The Da Vinci Code. That's a Templar Church. The Pope ordered the Templars burned at the stake for worshiping Satan or Baphomet. But they weren't completely destroyed. In fact, the Templars still exist in the world today. The Pope tried to get rid of the Templars completely, but some of them fled, and there are still some, some Templars in, the day, in today in the world. The Templar society still exists. Let's look at the connection of the Templars to the Masons. Albert Mackey wrote this book, The History of Freemasonry. Here's the first book, or first page of his book, and it says right there, I'll make it big, 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 bigger so we can read it, he says here, the Fraternal Order of the Free and Accepted Masons, or the Freemasons, is a secret, look at that word, society. Huh. Why was Charles Russell so interested in starting his own religious denomination, but he never wanted to call it a church? He'd always wanted to call it a society. Well, because he was a part of a secret society. So the Jehovah Witness Organization is also a secret society. Remember, it never calls itself a church. It's not a church. It's a secret society. Here's some quotes from the history of Freemasonry, this book. He says, Templars are, are nothing more than a branch of the Masons. Okay, so the Templars, the Knights Templars, are Masons. Again, he says, the Templars were founders of Masonry in Europe. He says, the Knights Templar started the institution of Masonry. Oh, so the Templars started what's called today Masonry, or the Masons. Okay, well let's look at some more. Let's run this rabbit trail and see where it leads us. Who are the Masons? The Masons, or Masonry, is a secret society which worships the light bearer, or Lucifer. You can always tell who the Masons are by their little symbol here, with a G in the middle. But what do you have here? Well, you have the sun, and you have the all-seeing eye. Well, that reminds me of the Illuminati. And here you have the light bearer. If you're a Mason, and I hope you're not, you find out that in Masonry you always talk about worshiping the light bearer. But they don't want you to know who you're really worshiping until you get up to the 33rd or 32nd degree, and then they tell you, oh, by the way, the light bearer is Satan or Lucifer, so we really worship Lucifer. So Masonry is the worship of Lucifer. Here's a man named Albert Pike. Albert Pike says, Masonry is the oldest religion in the world. It is the adoration or worshiping of Lucifer. Hmm. Well, here's Mr. Russell. It's interesting. They kind of look the same. They got these white beards. <laughs> and what does Mr. Russell do? Well, let's look at Mr. Russell, who, by the way, looks a lot like this Albert Pike guy. In Albert Mackey's book about the Masons, he says, The Templars and the Masons adopted symbols and symbolic words derived from religion by which they could distinguish one another from non-believers. That is, people that didn't believe like them or didn't worship Lucifer like they do. So let me ask you a question. Let's ask this question. Do the Templars and Masons have secret symbols? What is that? Well, here is this Albert Pike guy, and again, there's his cross that he wore around his neck. That's called the Baphomet Cross. Notice it's a cross with three lines through it instead of just one. And it's always at an angle. Now let's look at the, this Baphomet Cross. If you're in the cult, you're familiar with what's called the Baphomet Cross. Here's a guy named Henry C. Clawson. And look at Mr. Clawson. He's a mason. And look what he wears on his head. He's got right on his forehead the symbol of Satan. Satan's cross. The Baphomet Cross. Wow. 
I seem to remember a verse that talks about having the mark of the beast in your hand or on your forehead. Well, this guy had a really big forehead. But look at that Baphomet cross. So here's the cross of Baphomet. Now let's compare that. Let's go back to Charles Russell and his Society of Watchtower and his magazines, and let's look. Oh, well that kind of explains why he would want to have a cross that's falling over to one side. It's a secret symbol to announce to other Masons, hey, guess what? We're not a church. We're a secret society. So there's your Baphomet cross. Huh. Interesting. What is it? It's a symbol of Masonry. And notice, again, here's his uh, Watchtower magazine, and look how he has the, the sun around it, just like the Masons love to have the sun around their symbols. Why? Because they worship the light bearer, Lucifer. Are these satanic symbols? Are they symbols that really announce to the world, hey, we really are worshipers of Lucifer, come join our society? So let's look at a summary quickly. What is the summary here? Well, Mr. Charles Russell, the founder of the Jehovah Witness movement, or the Watchtower Society, was a member of an order that worships Baphomet, or Satan. There he is. Baphomet, Satan. So there's the, the Templars. He was a member of the Templar Order, and the Templars founded Masons, or Masonry, the sect that also worships the light bearer, which is Satan. So do you see a connection there? <laughs> I do. I see this Charles Days Russell guy. No wonder he wouldn't want to call his denomination a church, because it doesn't worship God. It worships this guy. It's a secret society, and he's a Mason. Interesting. Was Charles Russell a Satanist? There you go. I didn't translate that into English, so this is still in Spanish. Was Mr. Russell a Satanist? Here's the words of Mr. Charles Taze Russell himself. Here's what he says. I got this from this film, uh, Witnesses of Jehovah by Jeremiah Films. Great film. If you get a chance to watch it, you should see it. Mr. Russell tells us, he says, A truth presented by Satan himself is as certain a truth as if it were presented by God. Accept the truth wherever you might find it. It doesn't matter if it contradicts. Huh? The Bible tells us that Satan is a liar. I wouldn't accept anything Satan says as though it was truth. But that would explain why this man said that, because he is really a follower of Lucifer, or Satan, the light bearer. Let's look more into Mr. Russell, his satanic, occultic, evil practices that were taught him by his Templar connection. Again, let's go back to the Templars. The Templars and the Masons practice arts or rites. And by the way, in their worship service, these secret societies, they called their rites or their sacred arts mysteries. And they took these mysteries from the Elysian mysteries or from Babylon. They were taken from the ancient occult practices of Babylon. So it all goes back to mystery Babylon. In Mason, Masonry, exactly like the Watchtower Society or the JW Movement, they call their teachings mysteries. Isn't that interesting? Mr. Russell, Musk Russell wrote a book. It's entitled The Finished Mystery. He wrote many books, but one of his books was entitled The Finished Mystery. Here's his book, The Finished Mystery. And look at the very front cover. A Babylonian symbol <laughs> on the front cover. Oh, shame on you, Mr. Russell. You're not a Christian. You're a Luciferian Babylonian worshiper. That's what you are, you Templar. You. Now, don't confuse those Babylonian evil mysteries with the true mysteries. In the Bible, we have the mysteries of Paul. There's seven mysteries in the Bible. And those are the true mysteries of God. These, from this guy and from this group, are the mysteries of a cult or the devil. So right there in the front of his book about a mystery is that Babylonian symbol tying it all back to Babylon. Again, Albert Mackey in his book, The History of Freemasonry, he says on page 84, you will find that you can trace masonry from Babylon and Assyria to Egypt and from Egypt to Judea and from Judea to France and from France to England. He continues, and from England to America. Isn't it strange? That when Christopher Columbus set sail from Europe and he discovered the New World, he, he discovered America, isn't it just odd that he just so happened to have a red cross on the sails of his ships? What was he doing? He was announcing, hey, look at me, I'm a part of the secret society. I'm a Luciferian, and I'm going to claim the New World for Lucifer. 
See, the world's not what it's cracked up to be. The world is full of people that worship Lucifer. It's an interesting note that Jehovah Witnesses today teach that all Christian religion is evil and apostate. And they say that all Christianity has gone into apostasy, and they call all other religions but themselves Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. <laughs> but if you actually study Mr. Russell and the secret society he was a part of that ties back to masonry, then you find out that this religion, the Jehovah Witness religion, or the Watchtower Society, has more in common with Babylon. And we find a lineage, a line directly from Babylon, and he's really just teaching the Babylonian mysteries. So Mr. Russell wrote a book. He actually wrote many books, but one of the books he wrote, he wrote a book entitled The Divine Plan of the Ages. In that book, he went to the Great Pyramid of Egypt. And he says, the Great Pyramid of Egypt tells us certain things. It's a gigantic symbol or a gigantic landmark, and it tells us the measurements. And he says that, that huge pyramid in Egypt, it tells us certain things, and he says the measurements indicate the year, the weight of the earth, the distance from the sun, etc. And he taught very heavily that that great pyramid of Egypt, remember, the Babylonian mysteries went to Egypt, and then you know, you can't study this Charles Russell guy without saying that all that he teaches, it all came from a background of his secret society and the learning of the Templar movement, not from the Bible. But he taught that this huge, gigantic pyramid showed a certain date as the date of the end of the world. Care to guess what date? 1914. Why, that date that the Millerites, or actually the Seventh-day Adventists said, were the end of the world. So I got a question. Should we base our doctrine on the Great Pyramid? Or should we base our doctrine on the Bible? I don't go looking at other signs outside of the Bible to try to set dates for the end of the world. Well, Mr. Russell did. By the way, pyramids have always been connected with the worship of Lucifer or Satan. All over the world, there are pyramids. And all over the world, as you study these pyramids, you find, especially like this one in Tikal, they would bring sacrifices and they would cut out the hearts of their victims and they would sacrifice them to Satan or Lucifer. Human sacrifice. You know, it's kind of sad when someone becomes so infatuated with, with pyramids because pyramids are very occultic in nature. Why? They go back to Egypt. And pyramids, they're mason, masonry, you know, as above, as below. Why? The New World Order up on the right or top left corner. Why the New World Order down here in the bottom left is is a gigantic pyramid with an all-seeing eye. I would watch out for a guy that is infatuated with pyramids and is looking for symbols in pyramids. But the th strangest thing, the most strangest thing about this man, Charles Taze Russell, that started the Jehovah Witness movement, that started the Watchtower, is where he is buried. This is the, the marker or the tombstone of Mr. Charles Russell. It's a gigantic pyramid. Now isn't that odd? Charles T. Russell was born in 1852. But you know what's even more odd about Mr. Russell? Even though it's very odd that he's buried under a gigantic pyramid, what's more odd is the day that he died. This is an actual picture of his tombstone on the side of that pyramid, and look at when Mr. Russell died, October 31st, 1916. October 31st, that's Halloween night. That's all witches' night. That's an occultic night. Why did Charles Russell just happen to die on Halloween night? Could it have been he maybe he sold his soul to the devil, and that's when the devil came to collect? <laughs> Halloween night, he died. Let's go back to Fritz Springmeier. Fritz Springmeier wrote Bloodlines of the Illuminati, and Fritz Springmeier says that Charles Russell was really someone that was in the Illuminati. And according to his research, Charles Russell was assassinated by the Illuminati in a satanic ritual. You say, oh, that's so far-fetched. Well, then why is it just so happened to be on Halloween night that he died? Sounds pretty plausible to me. So here's Mr. Russell, the old Templar, who, if you study Templar, you see it goes back to ancient Babylon, and it goes back and it ties in with masonry. Here he was, and here's what Mr. Springmeier says. 
Mr. Springmeyer tells us here in his book, Bloodlines of the Illuminati, Charles T. Russell was ritually murdered by Illuminati on Halloween night and has his ashes protected below a pink granite pyramid made from the sacred enchanted rock mountain at a sacred site 18 miles north of Fredericksburg, Tennessee. The pyramid is in a cemetery in what was once Allegheny, Pennsylvania, but is now Pittsburgh. And so here is Mr. Russell, buried beneath a pyramid. And he died on Halloween night. Is it true what Mr. Springmeyer says? I don't know, but I know it's quite interesting. Now let's get back to the history of the Jehovah Witness movement. Now let's look at this guy, Charles Tage Russell, this Mr. Templar, this Mr. Secret Society guy. He said and he prophesied that the world would end in 1914. Remember, he got that from the Millerites or the, uh, the uh, Adventists. And he backed up his claim because he said the pyramid proves that 1914 will be the end of the world. Well, what happened? What happened in 1914? Did, did you read about it in the papers? Do you, do you know what happened in 1914? Do you remember? You remember what happened? <laughs> nothing. That's right. Nothing happened. So Mr. Russell prophesied the end of the world is 1914. And it was a what does the Bible say again about that? Well, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, which, by the way, he did. He claimed to be a, a, a witness of Jehovah. So he claimed that Jehovah told him 1914 is the end of the world. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. That is not what the Lord spoke. Now here is the verse in Deuteronomy 18.22 that I just read in Spanish. In Spanish, instead of saying the Lord, it said Jehovah. Remember, he claims to be a Jehovah witness. So, was Charles Russell really a witness of Jehovah? He calls himself a Jehovah witness, but he did not say what Jehovah said, according to the Bible. He lied. He said the end of the world will be in 1914, and it didn't come to pass. Look at me, I'm a witness of Jehovah! Liar, liar. You did not witness what Jehovah told you. You made up a date that you got from occultism, from pyramids, and from another religion that lied and prophesied incorrectly. And you tried to deceive people. You liar. You're not a witness of Jehovah. Why, you're a witness of Satan. Because John 8, 44 says, You are of your father, the devil. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So when a man lies, guess what? He's of his father who? Not Jehovah. The other guy. So Mr. Charles Russell was not a worshiper of Jesus Christ or of God. He was a worshiper of Lucifer. He wasn't a church starter. He didn't start a religion or a church. He started a secret society full of lies. Well, when the Lord didn't come back in 1914, when Jehovah didn't come and set up his kingdom as this guy said he would, Mr. Rutherford quickly changed the date to 1915. You know, remember, just like old Miller did? Well, it didn't happen on that day, so I really meant this day. And when that didn't happen, then he changed it again. So first, Mr. Russell said 1914 would be the end of the world, and it wasn't. So he said, well, I, I meant to say 1915 to be the end of the world, and it wasn't. So then he said, no, 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 what I really meant to say was 1918. Well, Mr. Russell... Strike one in 1914. Strike two in 1915. Strike three in 1918. Strike three, you're out, buddy. I don't want anything to do with you. I can't continue on with you. You are a false prophet. You struck out three times. Well, what I meant to say was the Lord will come in 1914. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, well, or, um, sorry, I meant 1915. Yes, yeah, well, no, sorry, I meant to say 19. Yeah, you were wrong all three times. The end did not arrive when he prophesied. But the end did come. At least it came for Mr. Russell. Because Mr. Russell ended up dying in 1916. He died before 1918 when he prophesied the end of the world. So he didn't get to see his last prophecy that he was a liar. So Mr. Russell died in 1916. When Mr. Russell died, this man took over the Watchtower Society. Remember, it's a society, not a church. Now this man is scary. This man is Mr. Rutherford. 
look at this guy. When I look at this guy, I look at his eyes, and you know what I see? I see snake eyes. I see a scary, scary person. This is Joseph Franklin Rutherford, who lived from 1869 to 1942. He took over the Watchtower Society. Would you look at his eyes? Man, that's scary. It looks like snake eyes, doesn't it? I mean, that guy just looks like a shyster, like someone who just can't wait to grab you and deceive you and lie to you. Can't even stand to look at this guy. But this is the guy that took over the Watchtower Society. Mr. Rutherford officially became president of the society in January 6, 1917. And he began to go around and he did the same thing while he learned really well from Mr. Russell how to start a cult. And he wrote many books, and by the way, he was a liar and a false prophet too. Here's some of the books that he wrote. In this book, entitled, You Can Live Forever in the Paradise on Earth, he wrote these words. Since the, scriptures, since the scriptures definitely fix the fact that there will be a resurrection of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and other faithful ones of old, and that these will have the first favor, we must expect the year 1925 to witness the return of these faithful men of Israel. <laughs> so in his book, this guy set the date of 1925 as the date of when Guess what? Will be the end of the world and the coming kingdom of Jehovah. So he literally said Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will come in 1925. Was he right? Nope. Strike one, Mr. Rutherford. But he believed so much that this would happen that he did something. See, he was wrong, just like Russell, he was a liar. He believed so much much and he was so convinced that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would come in 1925 that he went out and he bought them a mansion. Here's the mansion that he bought for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to live in when they came back. And he was so convinced of his teaching that when he bought this mansion, this beautiful huge mansion, he literally put the deed in the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> well, did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob return? Nope. No, they didn't come. Once again, a man in a long line of people in this denomination that lied. But you know, Mr. Rutherford sure had a great time living in that mansion for them, waiting for them to come. I mean, he got a nice mansion to live in. Boy, religion really pays, doesn't it? Must have been nice living there, Mr. Rutherford, as you lie to people in such a nice lap of luxury. He later went on to set another false date for the end of the world, just like Russell and Miller before him did. Ugh. He said in 1941, this will be the date for the end of the world. Nope, didn't happen. Liar! <laughs> you know, I don't know how anyone could be a Jehovah Witness when they study the history of the Jehovah Witness movement. It's full of lies and people prophesying the days of the end of the world, and it doesn't come to pass. Well, Mr. Rutherford died on January 13th, 1942, after having lived in the lap of luxury, made millions of dollars off of his books and his prophecies. Here's one of his brand new Cadillacs. The man lived high on the hog and was very rich, but he was a false prophet. The Bible warns us about such people in 2 Timothy 3.13. It says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Here's Mr. Rutherford, like I said, his eyes look like snakes, so I had to put, you know, black over his eyes. I can't even stand to look at his eyes because it looks like he has demons, the way they look like snakes. But after the death of Mr. Rutherford, the third president of the Watchtower Society, remember, it's a society, it's not a church, it's not a, a, a true Christian religion, it's a secret society. The third president was Nathan Homer Knorr, who took power only five days later. Under his leadership, the Watchtower Society, remember it's not a church, made a new translation of the Bible called the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. So what they did is they said, you know what we need to do? We need to translate our own Bible into English. And they called it the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. Why would they call their translation the New World Translation, the New World Bible? Could they be referring to the New World Order? Is that what they're talking about, that they wanted a Bible for the New World Order? Or maybe they're talking about the New Age Movement, because, you know, they're into the occult, and the occult is kind of connected with the New Age Movement. Remember, Mr. Taze Russell was buried under a pyramid. 
Strange, quite strange. But here is their translation, the New World Perversion, excuse me, the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. And this Bible was put together by these people who translated it. Now, here is the Spanish version. Like I said, I they originally did this in Spanish, so I went ahead and translated it into English. But it says here, it is the great responsibility to translate the Holy Scriptures from their original languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. In 1969, the committee presented an interlinear translation from the Greek text revised by Westcott and Hort. Now, wait a minute. Who are Westcott and Hort? And why did they go to their text to translate their own Bible, this, this sect, this cult, the Jehovah Witnesses? Well, I've got to divert into another rabbit trail because this all ties together. There were two men named Westcott and Hort who printed their own Greek text in 1881, which is called the Critical Greek Text. Uh, is it right to be critical of the Bible? The Critical Text? Uh, I'd be really critical of that because it sounds like they're criticizing the Bible. Well, these two men, Westcott and Hort, they didn't believe in the Word of God. They didn't believe that the Bible was true. And by the way, these men were occultists. That's right, these men too were men that were into the occult. There's a lot of good books that you can read about these people. But these men tried to speak to the dead. They practiced what they called high communion. No, uh, let me rephrase that. They practiced what they called communion of the saints. What these men would do is they would go into a church in the middle of the night when it was as dark as it could be, and they'd get down on their knees, and they would pray. You say, wow, isn't that great? Isn't that pious? No. They weren't praying to God. They were praying to the saints. And they would pray to dead people, and they would literally say that the saints or the dead people would speak to them. What does the Bible say about speaking to dead people? That, that isn't right. So these guys were very evil. There's a good book about it, The Westcott and Hort Only Controversy by Phil Stringer. He talks about these guys and this evil practice, which sounds like a cult to me. It sounds like talking to demons. But these guys did not want the true Bible. Now, the Bible text, the preserved line of Bible text by true Christians in the Old Testament is the Hebrew Masoretic text. And these are the pure texts that were protected by the Jewish priest in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we have the true text, the Textus Receptus. This consists of over 5,000 manuscripts that agree among themselves over 95% of the time. So this is where the true Bible comes from. This is where our King James Bible comes from. This is the true Bible line of text. Well, we have a false line of Bible text perverted by Satan and false Christians. The Old Testament is the Hebrew critical text put out by a German named Kittel. I just think that's so funny, a German. God gave the Word of God in the Old Testament to Jews. But yet, these people said, no, we need to get it from a German. What, wasn't, wasn't it Germans that killed the Jews? in World War II? Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to go to a German that's guilty of the Holocaust and say, hey, what does the Bible really say? If you want the Old Testament, you go to the Jews. Now, the New Testament is the Greek critical text. And Westcott and Hort took two manuscripts, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts, and they made their own New Testament from these two Greek texts. These two Greek texts are so corrupt and have so many errors and mistakes that there's over 3,000 differences between Vaticanus and City Catechus in just Matthew through John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if you want a pure New Testament, you go to manuscripts that are 5,000 of them that match. But Westcott and Hort says, well, we don't want the 5,000 witnesses. We want these two witnesses, and we want to make a Bible out of these witnesses. And they did. What they came up with was a horrible, critical translation, a Bible that attacks the deity of Christ and takes out verses. But this line over here is the true line of text, the Hebrew Masoretic and the Textus Receptus. This line of text is where the new corrupt versions like the NIV and the JW Bible come from. If you ever looked at an NIV, NIV is missing whole verses. I can't believe how anyone can say they're a Christian and use an NIV Bible. Well, these guys, Westcott and Hort, they made their critical text based upon these two very corrupt texts. So let me make sure you understand what I'm saying here. These two occultists, these two guys that would pray and say that, that people talked to them when they were praying, probably demons, they made their own New Testament of the Bible. And they used these two manuscripts, Vat and Sin. <laughs> I, I abbreviated, but isn't that funny? When you uh, uh, abbreviate, one of the ones is Sin. 
And they use these texts to change the Word of God with their own opinions, taking out many words and indeed affecting true Bible doctrine. So what the Jehovah Witnesses did is they did the same thing when they came to translate their own version of the Bible into English when they made their New World Translation. So here is the New World Translation. This, of course, is the Spanish. And just let me show you how horrible it is. I, didn't, I wasn't able to get the English version. I only had the Spanish when I did this. But here is Mark 11.26. Now I want you to look for Mark 11.26 in the New World Translation. Oh, here it is, 26. What? There's just the line there. They took out the entire verse of Mark chapter 11, verse 26. Why would you remove an entire verse of the Bible? Here is Acts 8.37. Where is Acts 8.37 in their text? Well, it's right here. It's right... What? It's just a line. They took out the entire verse of Acts 8.37. It's a horrible translation. Here's Mark chapter 9, verse 44 and verse 46. And it's in English as well. This is the Spanish text but it's translated directly from the English text. So in the English text as well, you look for Mark 9.44 and Mark 9.46, they're completely removed. This so-called Bible is horrible. They take out whole verses, they even take out words. And Luke 4.4 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. They took out, but by every word of God. Their Bible says, Man shall not live by bread alone. And that's it, period. They took out, but by every word of God. Why would they not want you to live by every word of God? Because they took out a lot of the words of God in this false translation. Why would they do that? Because they followed the corrupt Bible manuscripts. Gail Ripplinger, G.A. Ripplinger, wrote a book called New Age Bible Versions. She explains how there is a diabolical and satanic conspiracy against the pure words of God today. And she shows how Satan is changing the Word of God little by little with each new version of the Bible that they publish. And it's all to water down the true Word of God. So you need to be careful of new versions of the Bible. The true Word of God is the King James Bible. Everything else is a perversion of the Scriptures. So what about this Jehovah Witnesses Bible? This is the New World, Order Transla uh, the new World Translation. Is it a reliable translation? We've already seen they take out whole verses. Well, here's a scholar, and look what he says. He says, when I look at certain passages of the scriptures that appear to be against their point of view, the Jehovah Witnesses, they translate it wrong deliberately and deceitfully, which is inexcusable. That is not only dishonest, but diabolical. So this guy, he says, I've read the New World translations, and he says, this is horrible. Their translation, it's, it's deceitfully done in a diabolical or evil manner. The word diabolical means satanic. So, the New World Translation of the Bible is a satanic Bible. This man here continues, and he says, I have never found any other so-called translation that departed so much from what the Scriptures truly teach. It is very far off from the original Hebrew and Greek. So, stay away from the New World Translation. He even continues even more. No one can be guided by their Bible because it is so deceitful. It has deliberately been changed in certain passages with the goal of making it line up with their teachings or their doctrine. It has twisted the scriptures in any pa many passages, especially in those that deal with the deity of Christ. So when the Bible says that Jesus Christ is God, their Bible changes a lot of passages that teach that. Who would want you to believe that Jesus Christ is not God? Uh, uh, oh yeah, Lucifer or Satan. Satan doesn't want you to believe that Jesus Christ is God. What was it again? The Jehovah Witness Society. Right, it's a secret society. And what is that secret society? It's based on the Templars that worship Satan or Baphomet. Okay, now it's all starting to come together. They started the Masons and the Masons worship Lucifer. Oh, now I understand. It's almost as if Satan himself translated the Bible. So the JWs changed the Word of God. What does the Bible say about this? Does the Bible say it's okay to change God's Word? Well, Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be find a, found a liar. Do not change the Bible, or you'll be a liar! Well, we've already seen that Miller was a liar. 
Uh, Charles Russell was a liar. Rutherford was a liar. Oh, so if they're liars, it's nothing to them to change God's word, and that's what they did with their New World false translation. Deuteronomy 4.2 says, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. Revelation 22.18 says, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Revelation 22.19 says, If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. It is a very serious thing to cut up the Bible like they've done. In the name of religion, they've taken the Bible and started cutting out verses. And they made a false translation. They mistranslated the Bible on purpose so that the Watchtower Society, remember it's not a church, could teach their own doctrines rather than the doctrines of the Bible. We're going to see about this a little bit more, how when they change the Scripture and they mistranslate, how it does affect doctrine. So who did the translating of the New World Order translation? Oh, I'm sorry. It, yeah, the New World Translation. It's called the New World Translation. It sure sounds like the New World Order Translation, doesn't it? Who did the translating work of the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures? Well, this track here says... In 1961, the Jehovah Witnesses published their own uh, whole Bible entitled The New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures in one volume. They, like the publishers of the American Standard Version, did not give the names of the translators who did the translation, saying it was only a translation authorized by its creator. So, who translated that Bible and did such a bad job at it? They won't tell you. Nobody wanted to put their name on it. Why? Maybe it was because it was so bad, nobody wanted to have their name on it and, say, and, and see who did it. So to this day, nobody knows who translated the New World Translation of the Jehovah Witness Bible. But it doesn't end there. The Watchtower Society did another translation of the New Testament, which was done by a guy named Johannes Gerber. Here is Johannes Gerber. Here's his New Testament translation. Now, the way this guy did his translation of the Bible is sick. It's utterly disgusting and offensive to any true Christian. It says here, Johannes Gerber was a spiritualist or occultist who did his translation work under the direction of spirit messengers who spoke through his wife who professed to be a spirit medium. Now, get this. His wife said she could speak to spirits. And so this guy says, I'm going to translate the New Testament. And he said, honey, tell me what the spirits say that I should write as I translate the Bible. Well, what are the spirits? They're demons. So this means that spirits or demons told him how to translate words in the Bible. Does it get any worse? What does the Bible say about that? Well, 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, what is that, unclean spirits, and doctrines of devils, demons. It sounds like to me the Jehovah Witness or Watchtower Society had demons help them translate the Bible. Now, question. Could it have been demons or unclean spirits that told Mr. Johannes Berger's, Gerber's wife how to translate the scriptures according to their own doctrines? Sure sounds like it to me. That would make the teachings of the Jehovah Witness movement doctrines of devils. Literally! Literally the doctrines of devils because devils whispered in their ear how he said he should translate the Bible. Well, this guy named President Knorr, who became the president of of the uh, Jehovah Witness Society. He died in 1977. Before he died, he made yet another prediction for the end of the world, and this time he predicted 1975, because you can't be a president of the Jehovah Witness Society without making a false prediction, so I guess he had to do the same thing as those before him. So he predicted that 1975 will be the end of the world, <laughs> and he died. Hey, enough with the date setting already! <laughs> no, they, they just keep on. This time they said the world would end in 1975. Do you know what happened in 1975? I mean, it's so famous. I mean, everybody knows. You know what happened in 1975? Do you know? Have you read about it? You know what happened in 1975? The world did not end in 1975. <laughs> it's another lie from this denomination, which isn't even a church. It's a secret society. The world did not end in 1975. Again, the Bible tells us, 
what we should do with a prophet who prophesies something that doesn't come to pass. Jeremiah 28, 9 says, The prophet which prophesieth, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord, that's Jehovah, hath truly sent him. So was Mr. Nor sent by God? Nope. Was Rutherford, was Russell, were any of these people really witnesses of Jehovah? Or were they false prophets that are lying and saying that the end of the world will be on this day? Yeah, they're false prophets. The fourth president was Frederick W. Franz. And he died in 1992. It's a shame he died because the literature of the Watchtower was millions now living will never die. Their own literature says, you know, if you're alive now, you won't die. And yet, poor guy, he died. What a shame. There's a great documentary about the Jehovah Witnesses put out by Jeremiah Films in 1986. And in this... Uh, documentary, it says that Jehovah Witnesses grew from 1 million to 3 million from 1963 to 1985. Well, we have a problem. They went out door to door and they, they knock on doors. That's how they do. And they come to your house and they give you their little watchtower magazine and they try to convert you to their religion. But there's a problem. Because the Jehovah Witness doctrine teaches that only 144,000 people can be saved. Which to them, being saved means can inherit the earth at the coming of Jehovah. And yet there was, in 1985, 3 million. Now, I'm not that great at math, but 3 million is greater than 144,000? So the Jehovah Witness movement said, well, we got a, we got a big problem. Our doctrine says only 144,000 can be saved, and we've got 3 million within our ranks of our secret society. So they kind of had to, to change their doctrine because they found out it was a lie, what they were teaching. <laughs> you get into the Jehovah Witness movement and you find a lot of false prophets. Matthew 7.15 says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are rav ravening, ravening wolves. Matthew 7.16 says, By your fruits you shall know them. You shall know them by their fruits. What is the fruits of the Jehovah Witness Society, the Watchtower Society? Uh, saying that the world will end and it doesn't. And lying and lying and lying and lying and lying. Titus 1, 10 and 11 tells us and warns us about such things and such people. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers whose mouths must be stopped to subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. You know, when they started, the whole witness would sell their magazine. They ask you to give them money to read their lies. Now they just give it away. I wouldn't take it if you gave it to me. No thanks. I don't want your false literature. But yet they go door to door and they give away literature. Well, I guess these guys would be so proud to know that there's still people following them. Wouldn't Russell and Rutherford be so proud to know that people are going in their name door to door saying, Excuse me, may I lie to you and deceive you and give you words of liars? <laughs> Because that's basically, if they were honest, what they'd have to say. Because that's what this movement is. Well, now we're going to look at the doctrines of the Jehovah Witnesses. What do they actually teach? Now, here are the words of Mr. F. N. Guy, a spokesman for Watchtower. Yes, I did not make that up. Those are his initials. This is Mr. F. N. Guy. So what does Mr. F. N. Guy <laughs> have to say? Mr. F. N. Guy, a spokesman for Watchtower, says, We believe that the Jehovah Witnesses are the only true religion. We follow the Bible completely. Really? Okay, Mr. F. N. Guy, do you really? Let's find out. Do you really follow the Bible completely? What do you teach about the most basic doctrine of Christianity, the doctrine of the Trinity? What do you teach about that, Mr. Guy? Well, the Watchtower Society, remember it's not a church, it's a secret society. The Watchtower Society denies the Trinity or the teaching that God is one God with three parts. Now, the Bible teaching and, and the doctrine of true Christianity is that there is one God, but that one God has three distinct parts, but they all make up one God. You see the line in between each one of these? The Holy Spirit is God, but the Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Son is God, but the Son is not the Father. The Father is God, but the Father is not the Holy Spirit. It's one God, but with three parts. Well, the Jehovah Witnesses deny that and say, we don't believe in that. Here's a quote from a Jehovah Witness publication. And here's the source here on the bottom. The Trinity was not conceived by Jesus or the early Christians. The plain truth is that this is another attempt by Satan to keep Christians from learning the truth about Jehovah and his son Jesus Christ. 
So the Jehovah Witnesses say, there is no Trinity, that's a lie from Satan. Okay, well let's ask Mr. Effin Guy, what does he say? He says, well some religions say that God and Jesus are one and the same, but the Bible doesn't teach this. For this reason, neither do the Jehovah Witnesses. So he says, we, the Jehovah Witnesses, do not teach that Jesus and God are the same. That Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are all part of one God. They do not believe in the Trinity. Is what he's saying true? Does the Bible teach a Trinity or does it not? He says the Bible doesn't teach the Trinity. Okay, well let's turn to the Bible ourselves and see. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 7, that for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. <laughs> That's the Trinity teaching, that they're three, but they're one. Now they'll say, well, that, that's not found in the Bible. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. There's a man named Dean Virgin who went back to the early church fathers. In a hundred years, two hundred years after Jesus, he found this verse quoted by the early church fathers. But today they try to say, no, this verse was added many years later. Well, then why did the church fathers quote it a hundred and two hundred years after Jesus? No, this verse has always been a part of Scripture. And this verse teaches the Trinity. That there are three, but there are one. The Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the Word, Jesus Christ, and then the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. So there is a Trinity. We even, we even see the Trinity in the very first chapter of the Bible. You go to the very first chapter of the Bible and it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now notice what it says. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Who talks like that? I never say... Let us go do this for our benefit. And I'm talking about me, myself. If I was talking about more than one, I'd say, then we will go do this, and then it will be our thing that we do. But here's God saying, let, He should have said, let me make man in my image after my likeness, if He's one. Well, He's one God, but He's three parts. And so God, the one God, is talking to all three parts, and He says, let us make man in our image after our... That's the Trinity. It's in plural, because it's one God. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses don't understand that. And the reason is they don't understand what we, human beings, are. The Bible tells us very plainly who we are. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So according to the Bible, every human being has three parts. They have a spirit, a soul, and a body. When you look at me and you see me, you see one person, Robert Breaker, but there's three parts to me. You see my body, but you don't see what's inside my soul, and you don't see my spirit. So we are one person with three parts. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. That's not three people. That's we're one person, but with three parts. That's a triune being. Why does a human being have three parts? Because we're made in God's image. It's one God with three parts. So, God has three parts. The body of God is Jesus Christ. The soul of God would correspond with God the Father, and the Spirit would be the Holy Spirit. God said, let us make man in our image. So, man, God is one God with three parts. He made man, one man, with three parts. That cannot be denied. So, we are made in God's image, and God has three parts, and so do we. Unless you're a Jehovah Witness. And then you say, no, we don't. What does the Bible teach? Well, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Isaiah 45, 5 says, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God besides me. God says, I'm not three different gods. I am one God. But in John 1, 18, in the New World Translation, again, this is the Spanish version, but I'll translate it into English. Look at what they do in John 1, 18. Jehovah Witnesses say there's only one God, but when you look in their own Bible, you find that they have two gods. And yet they accuse, they accuse Christianity of saying, well, you believe in three gods. And Christians go, no, we believe in the Trinity, one God with three parts. Yet, the Jehovah Witnesses' own Bible says these words in English, no man has seen God ever, the only begotten God that is in the position of the bosom. <laughs> they have God, which they call Jehovah, and then the only begotten God, well, who was begotten? That was Jesus. That's a little God. So the Jehovah Witnesses in their own Bible have two different gods. Yet they want to go around and say, hey, you're a Christian, you believe in three gods. Uh, here they have two gods rather than one. No, as a Christian, I believe in the Trinity, one God. Now, why does their Bible read that way? Uh, because it comes from the corrupt manuscripts. Now, if there's really only one God, then who is Jehovah? 
They say that Jehovah God is the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they claim that Jesus Christ is not God. He's a lesser creation or a lesser being. But what does the Bible teach about who Jehovah really is? If there is a trinity and God is one God with three parts, let's look at what the Bible teaches. Isaiah 43.3, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Now who is speaking here? Well, that, they would say that's Jehovah. So the Lord Jehovah, God, says, I am the Savior. All right? That's Old Testament. Here's the verse in Spanish. I am Jehovah God, your God, your Savior. So, it's talking about Jehovah. So, in English, it's saying, For I am the Lord Jehovah thy God, the only one of Israel, thy Savior. So, God Jehovah says He is the Savior. Alright, now let's go to the New Testament and look what it says about Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, it says, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior... Jesus Christ. Who's the Savior? Jesus Christ. The Old Testament says Jehovah is the Savior. The New Testament says Jesus is the Savior. How can that be? Unless it's the same God. And Jesus Christ is a part of the Trinity, so Jesus Christ is God. You see, Jehovah Witnesses do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. Yet Jehovah is the Savior, and Jesus Christ is the Savior. The word Jehovah is a transliteration of this Hebrew word. That word is very hard for us to pronounce today. We actually don't know, because there's no Hebrew vowel points, exactly how to say this. We don't know if it's Yahweh or Jehovah. So the old Jews wouldn't even try to pronounce this name. This is the sacred name of God. So what they would do is they'd say, we're not going to even try to pronounce it because we don't even know how to pronounce it correctly. So they said, what we're going to do, we're going we're to say Adonai, the Lord. Out of respect for the name of God, we don't want to pronounce it incorrectly. So every time we see this word, we say Adonai. Adonai means the Lord. When you get a King James Bible, every time in the King James Bible, when you see Lord, all caps, L-O-R-D in the Old Testament, that's this word in Hebrew. They did not put Jehovah, except four different times they did. But every place else, they put Lord in all capital letters as a sign of respect because that name of God is so holy. So Jehovah is the Lord, just as Jesus is the Lord. So the Old Testament, when you see Lord with all capital letters, it's talking about God. There's one God with three parts. But in the New Testament, we see Jesus Christ, and he's always called the Lord. Why would Jesus Christ be called the Lord Jesus Christ? Because he is Jehovah. He's part of the Trinity, the one God. So the Bible says, for our conversation is from heaven, for whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jehovah in the Old Testament says, I am one God, I am the one Jehovah, I am one, and I am the Savior. And Jesus Christ shows up and he says, I am the Savior. That must mean that Jesus Christ is God. Well, the Watchtower Society says of Jesus Christ, the true scriptures speak of the Son of God, the Word, as a God. He is a powerful little G God, but not the all-powerful God who is Jehovah. So again, they say that Jesus Christ is not God. He's another God, a less powerful God. Is that what the Bible teaches? No! Look at what it says in Revelation 1.8. Jesus Christ is speaking. Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is the Almighty. What does Almighty mean? The all-powerful God. Here it is in Revelation 22, 13, and then verse 16. Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, I, Jesus. Jesus is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus Christ is one with God as the Trinity. So summary, quickly, Jehovah is the Savior, and Jesus is the Savior. So Jesus is one with the Trinity. Jehovah is the Lord, and Jesus is the Lord. Jehovah is God, what's that make Jesus? Jesus Christ is God. So according to the Bible, there is no doubt that Jesus Christ is God. How is it then that the Jehovah Witnesses don't teach this truth? The only answer is because they don't believe the Bible. You talk to a Jehovah Witness and you ask them, is Jesus Christ God? They won't say yes, because they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. But let's look at some verses in the Bible that prove that Jesus Christ is God. 1 John 5.20 says, And we know that the Son of God is come. This is the true God and eternal life. Here's Thomas, the Apostle Thomas's confession when he saw Jesus Christ. He says, My Lord and my God. 
Here's another verse about God. And the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is also God. Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto who? Unto God. So God the Father is God. God the Son is God. And God the Holy Spirit is God. One God with three parts. So there is such a thing as the Trinity. It is one God with three parts. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, the Jehovah Witnesses have an entirely different God. They don't believe in the true God of the Bible. Here's Fritz Springmeier again. And uh, this is a DVD of his 1996 discourse, The World System. And this is a very studious man. He studies a lot and he finds a lot of things. He says, there are many not so there are many not so well known doctrines of the Jehovah Witnesses. For the first half of their existence, they taught a doctrine that says that Jehovah is a finite God that lives in the Pleiades, in a star constellation, in a star called Alcyon. And he sends messages to earth that take eight days to get there, and the message arrives to the governing body of Jehovah Witnesses, who is their only channel of communication with God. Now if that's true, that explains a lot. The Jehovah Witnesses don't believe in the true God, the creator of the universe. They have a little God that lives on a little planet that communicates with them. Well, that almost sounds like a uh, fallen angel. What do the Jehovah Witnesses teach about the deity of Jesus Christ? Well, the Jehovah Witness Society, remember it's a society, it's not a church, denies that Jesus Christ is the creator. Here's the words of Mr. F. and Guy, again, the spokesman for Watchtower. He says, the teaching about Jesus Christ is that Jesus is the Son of God. He was the first thing that Jehovah created, and by him the rest of the creation was formed. So according to the Jehovah Witnesses, and this man who's a spokesman, he says that Jesus is a creation, and he is not God, he's just a creation. He is not the creator, he's just part of the creation. But what saith the scripture? Is this what the Bible teaches? So far they've struck out. Everything that they teach in their doctrine is the exact opposite of what the Bible says, so part of course that we'd see the same thing again. Because in John 1, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning. So listen to who made all things. And all things were made by Him. Who? The Word. Verse 3. And without Him, who? The Word. Who's the Word? Jesus. Was not anything made that was made. So who was Jesus? We just read it. He was with God and was God. Jesus Christ is God and He is the Creator. And He made all things. He's part of the Trinity. In Ephesians 3, 9, it says God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God who created all things. That's in Ephesians 3, 9. These last words, by Jesus Christ, are taken out of all new versions of the Bible. If you don't have these last three words in your Bible, then you have a corrupt Bible. The King James Bible tells us, by Jesus Christ, things were created. Thank God for the King James Bible. Why don't modern Bibles have these words, by Jesus Christ? Well, because they're based upon these false texts, and they come from these guys who were occultists and spiritualists who changed the Bible. And their versions of the Bible attacks the deity of Christ. So to take out the words, by Jesus Christ, attacks the deity of Christ. Now do you see why the Jehovah Witnesses and the new versions of the Bible don't like that Jesus Christ is God? Because demons hate God, and they don't like that you learn that Jesus Christ is God. So Jehovah Witnesses teach that Jesus Christ is not God. But what does the Bible say? Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, the Bible says, Behold, a virgin shall be shall be with child, and shall be forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. What's that make Jesus Christ? God. He is God with us. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Who was manifest in the flesh? God. Who is Jesus Christ? God. Well, the Jehovah Witnesses hate that verse. So in 1 Timothy 3.16, what do they do? They change God to He. And so their Bible says He was put forth manifested in the flesh. Who's He? Who was manifested in the flesh? They don't say. But the true scriptures say God was manifested in the flesh. 
So here they deny that Jesus Christ is manifest in the flesh as Jesus. Why change this? Well, because they follow the corrupt, satanic manuscripts that attack the deity of Christ, the old Westcott and Hort. Now, Westcott and Hort again were spiritualist occultists who used a corrupt Egyptian text. And in one of these versions that they used, I can't remember if it was Vaticanus or Sinaiticus, if you go to 1 Timothy 3.16 and look at their text, you'll see why it was changed from God to He. The word God in Greek is Theos. The word He in Greek is Hos. So here's Theos, there's Hos. Now this is in capital, or this is all in lowercase. All right, now, sometimes they would make Greek manuscripts and they would put the letters in all capital letters. So the word for God is Theos in all capital letters, like this, and it's abbreviated. The word for Hos in all capital letters is this. Look how close those two words are. But the reason we know that it says God is because it has a little line right there in that Greek letter. Here's another example. See that line right there? If you go to the manuscript that these two guys used to change the Word of God from God to He, you know what you find? Very lightly in that manuscript there was a line here, but someone erased it. Someone did not want you to know that Jesus Christ was God, so they went in the manuscript and they tried to erase a little line to try to change the deity of Christ and try to change the greatest verse in the Bible, 1 Timothy 3.16, that proves that Jesus Christ is the God and to change it from God was manifest in the flesh to just, oh, there was a guy, some guy named He, some He, some guy, whoever He was, he who He was, was manifest in the flesh. Who erased that line? Someone led by devils. How deceitful. Over 5,000 manuscripts say God was manifest in the flesh, but these suckers said, no, we're going to take that one manuscript that is in doubt because someone erased the line, and we're going to choose that reading over 5,000 different witnesses that say God was manifest in the flesh. So the Jehovah Witnesses followed one corrupt text against 5,000 other texts that said that Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh. Why? To deceive us into thinking that Jesus Christ was not God manifest in the flesh, so that it would match their doctrine, because their doctrine is that Jesus Christ is not God manifest in the flesh. What does the Bible say about such people? Well, in 2 John chapter 7, the Bible says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Well, the Watchtower Society, the Jehovah Witnesses, they are deceivers. They try to deceive you into believing that Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh. And what are they? They're antichrists. If they're antichrists, what does that mean? They're led by false spirits. They're led by unclean spirits, our demons, our devils. In fact, in 1 John 4, 1, John tells us, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. False prophets, false prophets. Who's the false prophet? Oh, that's right. Miller prophesied falsely of when the world would end, and it didn't. Uh, Rutherford, uh, uh, Russell, yeah, yeah, those guys that prophesied the end of the world will be in 1914 or 1918 or 1925 or 19... Oh, well, who are they led by? Not led by the Holy Spirit of God. They're led by false spirits, the spirit of Antichrist. 1 John 4, 3 tells us, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Yep. And it's called the Watchtower Society. Now let's look at the subject of salvation. What do the Jehovah Witnesses teach about salvation? Well, you look at their literature, they have all these beautiful pictures about the coming kingdom of God. And their emphasis is, you have to live in order to get into the kingdom. They never talk about the salvation of the soul, only the salvation of the body. And they say, you need to endure the end so you can get into their kingdom. So the Jehovah Witnesses teach that there's no need to have your soul saved because Jehovah is coming soon and his followers will then inherit the entire earth for themselves. The book here, Millions Now Living Will Never Die. So they say, oh, don't worry about having your soul saved. They teach that the faithful ones in their religion can inherit the earth at the coming of Jesus who will then make the world a paradise. So then the emphasis is all about uh, living, 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 and making it until you get to the kingdom when Jesus comes. But what about death and dying? What about dying? What about the afterlife? 
Well, Jehovah's Witnesses never talk about what happens after you die. If you ask them what they believe after you die, well, they will say, well, nothing. You just cease to exist. They believe in what they call the annihilation of the soul. And as soon as you die, that's it. You don't exist anymore. But the Bible tells us that it is appointed on a man who wants to die, but after this, the judgment. According to the Bible, when you die, that's not the end. Why, there's a judgment that comes after death. The Jehovah Witnesses don't believe in that judgment after death. They only teach that someone can inherit the earth without dying. They never deal with the issue of death and judgment. Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, He said, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? There is a soul. What are you going to do with your soul? Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses never talk about the soul. They say, oh, no, it's not important. Yeah, it is. The Bible teaches that every one of us will die someday and that the soul goes to one of two places. When you die, either your soul goes to heaven or hell. So which one is it? Well, Jehovah's Witnesses never tell you about that. In fact, they don't believe in hell, as we'll see here in a minute. But the Bible tells us that those that are indeed saved go to heaven when they die. It says, we are willing, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.8 So when you die as a Christian, your body goes to the grave. Your soul is present with the Lord if you're saved. What about those who are not saved or lost? Where do they go? Where does their soul go when they die? The Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. So there's heaven and there's hell. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There is a place called hell. And your soul will go there if you're not saved. So why don't the Jehovah Witnesses preach the gospel and the necessity of being saved? Why don't they warn people about hell? I've talked to many Jehovah Witnesses and I asked them about that. Here's a young man in Honduras when I was living in Honduras as a missionary and I talked to him and he became a Jehovah Witness and I asked him, why, why did you decide to join that religion? His answer to me was, well, because they teach that there's no hell. He said, if there is a hell, my grandmother went there when she died, and I can't accept that. Thus, I follow Jehovah's Witnesses because they teach that there's no hell. He said, I just like that teaching because then I don't have to think that my grandmother is burning in hell. So that's why I became one of them. And that's what many of them say. Oh, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I don't believe in hell. So it's a good religion for me to follow because I don't believe in hell. Well, if that's the case, and that's true, and there is no such thing as hell, then there's no reason to get saved. And if after you die, you just cease to exist, then have you ever thought about what that means? If there's no judgment after you're, you die, then why live right? Why live a holy life? Why not just go rob a bank? If there's no judgment, if you never have to give account of yourself to God someday, why not go steal? Why not lie like Rutherford and, and Charles Taze Russell? And Why not cheat? Why not steal, lie, rob a bank? Why not murder someone and kill them? Why not fornicate? If there's no judgment, you don't have to pay for your sins, you don't have to give account to God, then why live a holy life? The Jehovah's Witnesses have no answer. They don't want to face death. They don't want to face judgment. If there's no judgment and no hell, then why live a holy life? But the Bible says there is a hell. And the wicked shall be turned into hell in all nations that forget God. Jesus said these words in John 3, verse 3 and 5. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, and he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You see, the Jehovah's Witnesses say, Well, it's all about the kingdom, the coming kingdom, and you've got to stay alive until you get into that kingdom. Okay, but the Bible says you cannot enter or you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Born again means saved. Why don't they preach how to get saved? Why do they talk about this kingdom, but they never warn you about hell? Hmm. We'll look at that a little bit more here in a minute. What do the Jehovah's Witnesses teach about the coming of Christ? Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses say, and this is the source from one of their books, It is an established fact that in the Scriptures that no human eye shall see Him as His second coming, nor will He come in a body of flesh. That's the Jehovah's Witness doctrine, that when... Jehovah comes, no eye shall see him. 
and he will not come in a body of flesh. Now, so far, everything we've seen that they say, the Bible says the exact opposite. So, would it be hard to find a verse that says the exact opposite? No, no. It would not be hard. All you have to do is go to the book of Revelation, only read down about seven verses. And the Bible said, Behold, he cometh in the clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they shall also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. This is Armageddon. When Jesus comes at uh, the rapture, those that are saved come out. But then he comes back at Armageddon. And when he comes back at Armageddon, every eye shall see him. Yet the Jehovah Witnesses say, No one will see him. It's almost like everything they say is the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. Let's look at a couple of the other of the teachings of the Jehovah Witnesses. They believe that Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel. Hmm. Again, the words of Mr. F. and Guy, spokesman for the Watchtower, he says, We believe that the Bible teaches that Jesus has various functions to perform for Almighty Jehovah God. For example, the Hebrew Scriptures define him as Michael. No, no, no they don't. No they don't. They actually teach that Michael the Archangel is really Jesus. No, he's not. If you read the Old Testament, if you read the Bible, you find out that Michael is an archangel, one of the five original archangels. Lucifer also was a cherubim. So he was a cherubim or an archangel. He is a creation. He is not God. Jesus Christ is God. They believe, as well, the Jehovah Witnesses, that Jesus Christ did not die on a cross. So if you ask the Jehovah Witnesses, well, did Jesus die on the cross? They say, no, no, Jesus didn't die on the cross. You say, well, so what do you believe, Mr. Jehovah Witness? They say, well, we believe that Jesus died on a post <laughs> or on a stick. So the teaching of the Jehovah Witnesses is Jesus did not die on the cross. He died on a post. All right? Once again, let's go to the Bible and see what the Bible says. Oh, yeah! Exact opposite of what they say. Because you don't have to read very far until you get to Matthew 27, 42, and it says, if he be the king of Israel... Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. So Jesus didn't die on a post or a stick. He died on a cross. Again, everything they teach is the exact opposite of what the Bible says. Why is that? The Jehovah Witnesses also believe that Jesus Christ did not resurrect in a literal body. They deny that Jesus Christ literally rose from the dead in the same body. They teach that the body of Christ was destroyed. I spelled destroyed wrong, excuse me. And that Christ raised him spiritually. Or that Jehovah raised him up spiritually. And they say afterwards that Jehovah gave Jesus Christ many different bodies. So the JWs say that when Jesus' body was there, it didn't rise again, as the Bible says. It just was destroyed completely and just ceased to exist. And what does the Bible say? <laughs> The Bible says that Jesus Christ rose again the third day according to the scriptures. They say these words. This is a, from a Jehovah Witness thing. The bodies in which Jesus manifested himself to his disciples were not the same body in which he was nailed to the tree. They were only bodies made for the occasion in which he appeared and was almost equal to the body in which he died. So the Jehovah Witnesses said Jesus had more than one body. How many bodies did Jesus have? Well, they say he had many. But what does the Bible say? According to the Bible, only one. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 says, How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? How is it that some of you are going around saying that nobody raises from the dead? Well, that's what the Jehovah Witnesses do. They say, no, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. His body was destroyed. He didn't bodily rise from the dead. How is it that you say that? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 14 and 15, If Christ be not risen in his body, that is our preaching vain, and our faith is also vain, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. The Apostle Paul says, if Jesus Christ did not rise again bodily from the grave, then our faith is completely vain. And we're all a bunch of liars telling everybody that Jesus rose again from the dead when he didn't. So either the Bible is a lie and the Jehovah Witnesses are true, or the Jehovah Witnesses are lying and the Bible is true. And the Jehovah Witnesses are found false witnesses of God. God. Does that mean that means they're not witnesses of Jehovah? They're not Jehovah witnesses. They're false witnesses of Jehovah. So they shouldn't call themselves the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah Witnesses. They should call themselves the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's false witnesses because they're bearing false witness when they say that Jesus Christ did not rise bodily from the dead. They also teach at death that the soul is destroyed or annihilated. They teach that as soon as you die, your body goes to the grave, and that's the end of you, and you don't exist anymore. Your soul is just completely destroyed, and you just don't exist anymore. 
Is that what the Bible teaches? Well, so far, uh, they don't have a very good track record, do they? So let's see if that's the true teaching of the Bible. When you die, is that it? That's the end of you and your soul is completely destroyed? Or what does the Bible say? Well, when we look at the book of Genesis, look what it says about Rachel when she died and what happened. Genesis 35, 18 says, And it came to pass, that as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she was called his name Benoni, and his father called him Benjamin. So, she died. When she died, what happened? Her soul was in departing. Her soul left her body when she died. So the Jehovah Witnesses teach when you die, your soul just <clears throat> explodes or blows up or something and ceases to exist. But the Bible teaches, no, when you die, your soul leaves. And when your soul leaves your body, it goes to one or two places, either heaven or hell. So according to the Bible, at death, when someone dies, the soul leaves and goes to one of two places. Heaven or hell. Why don't the Jehovah Witnesses tell people that? Why, it's almost like they want to deceive people into going to this place, hell. Because they certainly don't tell them how to get over here to this place, heaven. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Now, another one of the teachings of the Jehovah Witnesses, I like to call them the Jehovah Windbags, <laughs> because they're full of hot air, they sure like to talk a lot, but they never tell you the truth. The Jehovah Witnesses don't believe in a literal hell. They do not believe that hell exists. They deny the existence of hell. But let's go to the Old Testament, Proverbs 15, 11, and see what Jehovah said himself about hell. These are the words of Jehovah himself in the Old Testament. Jehovah says, hell and destruction are before the Lord, before Jehovah. How much more than the hearts of the children of man? Even Jehovah, the Lord, God, said, yeah, hell and destruction are before me. There is a hell. God says it exists. Jesus says... To the Pharisees, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how shall you escape, escape the damnation of hell? Matthew 23, 33. But Jehovah's Witness just says, nah, we don't believe in hell. The Bible says it over and over and again. Another thing that Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in is getting a blood transfusion for any reason. They are against taking a blood transfusion. Here's a tract of theirs in which they tell you you can't have a blood transfusion. They base their doctrine upon this verse, Leviticus 7, 27. Whatsoever soul it be that eateth any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. Now notice what it says, that eateth any blood. The Bible prohibits taking blood into your mouth and eating or drinking blood. But that's taking blood into your mouth. The Bible says nothing about taking a blood transfusion, putting blood into your vein to stay alive. The Bible says don't take it in your mouth so it goes in your stomach. It doesn't say put it directly into the vein. So that's kind of junk for them to say you can't have blood transfusion. That's not in the Bible. The Bible just says don't drink blood. They're also anti-patriotic. They prohibit saluting the flag. They, they prohibit military service. The Jehovah Witness cult prohibits voting in elections. They prohibit children from taking any part in any school holidays. So the Jehovah Witnesses are very cultic in nature. Here's a book written by this guy in which he tells the Jehovah Witnesses refuse blood transfusions, refuse uh, donating vital organs, refuse saluting the flag, serving in armed forces, voting, singing a national anthem, uh, refuse to celebrate birthdays or any holidays of any sort. The Jehovah Witness movement is a cult. There's no other way to explain it. It is a secret society and a cult. And it is not a Christian denomination. They also practice what they call disassociation, where they disassociate with anyone they don't like. It's almost like they practice their own Spanish Inquisition. They rule their cult members harshly with a rod of iron, watching them like a hawk, and disfellowshipping within those in their sect that don't obey everything they say, punishing those that they deem unfaithful. So if you're a part of this Jehovah Witness sect, you have to do everything they say or else they kick you out and they call that disassociation they also have a thing like that in the catholic church they call it excommunication now many of the teachings of the watchtower society remember it's a society not a church it's a secret society are anti-biblical and even satanic as they are as the members live in constant fear See, it's a cult, and what cults do is they put you in constant fear, and they tell you, you can't be saved unless you're a member of us, and you have to be a part of our society to know the truth, or else, or else you'll be in trouble. 
So that means that the Jehovah Witness people are slaves to their diabolical religion. They live in fear. What does the Bible say about that? For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1 7. The Jehovah Witness cult even prohibits its members to view anything contrary to the teaching of the Watchtower Society and anything that critiques their religion. So everything that I'm presenting to you today that you're watching, the Jehovah Witness Watchtower Secret Society will not allow any of their members to see. Isn't that a shame? Oh, how that must make Jehovah cry to see such a thing. To see on this earth a secret society that preaches against the Bible. And all of its doctrines are exactly opposite of what the Bible teaches. And yet, they can't even look at the Bible or something like this to try to show them the truth. That cult says, no, no, don't ever watch something that will tell you the truth. That's a shame. Second Peter 2.1 says, there are false prophets among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift, swift destruction. We've already established that the Jehovah Witness movement is a false movement, with full of false prophets, false prophecies, lies, false doctrine. I'm going to give you some testimonies of people that were in this society, and what they say about it. There are many pamphlets, tracts, and other materials pointing out the false doctrines of the Jehovah Witness cult. They're all over. Go to the bookstore. They've got books everywhere. Why Jehovah Witnesses will lie. Why Jehovah Witnesses aren't telling the truth. A lot of people see this, but they hide this from their people, and they tell their people, no, you can't read anything that critiques our religion. But not all of these books are from people like me. Some of them are from people who were actually in that religion, who saw the truth and got out. For example, here's a guy that wrote a book, Christian Crisis of Conscience. His name is Raymond France, and he was a Jehovah Witness for 60 years before he got out of that cult. For nine years, he was one of the highest ranking members of that secret society. Here he is over here with the governing body. Old, old guy there. Look what he says. These are his words. I have to say that that was one of the most disillusionary experiences of my life. It was a rude awakening to see what actually took place in their meetings. I had imagined that the governing body would be a group of men that used the Bible as the Word of God and that it would be the force that controlled all of their decisions. But when I entered into the governing body, I found that they very seldom read the Bible and very rarely use it. Yeah, we've already seen that looking at their doctrine. They don't line up with the Bible. And time and again, when questions arose in cases in which they did present Scripture, the rules took precedent over the Scripture. So the rules of the cult, or the secret society, were more important to them than the Bible. And I couldn't help but think of the words of Jesus in Matthew 15, Thus have they made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Matthew 15, 6, Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Matthew 15, 9 says, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That sums it up nicely of what the Jehovah Witness cult is. This guy continues, he confessed that the Jehovah Witnesses not only don't use the Bible, but they don't read it either. Here's some folks here. Here's Leonard and Marjorie Cratian. They wrote this book. They were Jehovah Witnesses for 22 years. He was an elder in their society. Remember, it's a secret society. It's not a church. He was even a superintendent president. These two people are very much against this false religion which had deceived them. Remember, Charles Russell taught that the world would end in 1914. Well, here's another guy. Here's a guy named John Knight, who was a Jehovah Witness, and he was 15 years old during that time. So he remembers when 1914 came around, and guess what? Nothing happened. <laughs> he says, when 1914 rolled around, we had to change our point of view, and we had to change it again later. Well, we had to keep changing our doctrine, because we kept saying the world's going to end on this day, and it didn't. What do you do with somebody like that? Well, you leave that religion. It's false. Then 1975 rolls around, and Mr. Knight says, In 1975, I thought that that would be the last correct date. I put all my faith in that date. He says, I, when they said that 1975 will be the end of the world, he said, I thought, man, they finally got it right. And when it didn't happen, he said, that's it, I'm gone. <laughs> and he left that false religion. Well, it took him long enough. Here's a tract here, and I read this tract about the 1975 thing. And this tract says that when 1975 came around, 
23,000 Jehovah Witnesses rented the Dodger Stadium on October 31st, 1975, and they said that that would be the date that the end of the world would come on October 31st, 1975, and they all sat in the Dodger Stadium waiting for the world to end, and it didn't end. But what an odd date. Wasn't that the same date that old Charles Russell died? Halloween night? I'm telling you, there's some occultic practices in this cult. Now, here's a brief testimony of Mr. Charles Russell, the founder of the Watchtower Society, the founder. He was married at one time. And according to this source, he was taken to court by his wife who sought a divorce. And the court granted the divorce. She said that she wanted a divorce for the immoral conduct of Mr. Russell with another female. What does that mean? That means he was an adulterer. That means he was going out with another woman other than his wife. And it says, this guy, Mr. Russell, became filthy rich through his teachings and his books. And he defrauded his wife by not giving her the money that the court demanded that he give her. Wouldn't pay her the alimony. Wouldn't pay her the settlement that he was supposed to do. Not only was a liar and a deceiver and an adulterer, he didn't even give his money to his wife as the court ordered. I guess you would say that's a thief. The words of W. J. Schnell, who belonged to the Watchtower Society for 30 years, 30 years before his conversion to Christianity. He says that Russellism officially started in 1884, and in that time Russell persuaded six other men to go with him to the Allegheny Court and become incorporated as the Watchtower Society. This means that it's not a church. It's not even a Christian denomination. It is an incorporation. It is a business. This means that Mr. Russell was a businessman, not a religious man. No wonder it's called the society. It's a secret society, not a Christian denomination. Here's a pastor here, and this pastor says, They are not Jehovah Witnesses. They are businessmen of Satan. They are ambassadors of the devil. What are they doing? They're spreading the occult message. And all that they teach are doctrines of devils, not of God. Here's a guy who says he left the Jehovah Witness movement, he says they have lied to us, they have deceived us, and we have the documents to prove it. Yep, yep, we've seen some of the lies. Here's a woman who was prohibited to see her family. If you're a part of the Jehovah Witness movement, when you get into their kingdom hall, they tell you that unless your family are believers like them, you can't have any fellowship with them. So they do not condone you spending time with your family. They actually separate families. This woman says, they prohibited me to see my two sons and my five grandchildren. The Watchtower Society, remember it's a society, not a church, prohibited a grandmother from seeing her kids. Can you imagine what type of organization calls itself Christian and then prohibits sons and grandchildren from seeing their own grandmother and mother? <laughs> Good question. I think that's called a cult. The testimony of a man named Mr. Blizzard, now an ex-Jehovah Witness, and how the Watchtower teachings almost killed his baby. His child had medical problems and needed blood, and the Jehovah Witnesses prohibited a blood transfusion. Well, the doctor told the father, you have to make a decision, yes or no, whether you want your child to live or die. If the child gets a blood transfusion, it will live. If not, it will die. This man says, well, the Jehovah Witnesses filled the room and tried to give us Watchtower articles about artificial blood, telling us it's not permitted to give blood to your baby, and they tried to lay upon us a great sense of guilt. They said, the Jehovah Witnesses teach you can't have a blood transfusion. So this man followed his religion and rejected the blood transfusion. However, when the state found out, they took it to court and asked a judge to give a court order, asking the judge to give him the opportunity to save the life of the poor child. The judge granted that they do it in spite of the wishes of the parents. So the court stepped in, the state stepped in, and made that child take a blood transfusion against the parents' wishes. This guy says, the Jehovah Witnesses then threatened to excommunicate me. And when they found out that I allowed the state to give her blood so that she might live, one of the leaders told me, well, I hope your daughter gets hepatitis from that blood and dies. Can you imagine? What love. What a loving, caring religion. Where's the love? It's not there. It's interesting. This man's name was Mr. Blizzard. A blizzard is something very cold. The Bible says in Matthew 24, 12, in the last days, the love of many shall wax cold. That's a very cold-hearted religion. It doesn't care about people. It's a shame. So the Jehovah Witnesses prohibit their followers from taking a blood transfusion in order to live physically. But more worse than that, 
is that the Jehovah Witnesses do not preach the gospel of salvation through faith in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ so that someone can have a spiritual blood transfusion of eternal life, salvation through the blood of Christ. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Before I close today, I want to give you the gospel. But according to the Bible, salvation is through the blood atonement of Christ. Hebrews 9.22 says, And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You have to have blood. 1 John 1, 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Why are they so against the blood? Well, demons hate the blood of Jesus Christ. Could it be because they are led by demons in their false cult that they hate the blood atonement of Christ? Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Jesus Christ is the original blood donor. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that gives us salvation. It's the atonement of Christ. Romans 5.11 says, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Have you received the blood atonement of Christ? You need blood. You need a transfusion. Spiritually, you need the gospel. Salvation is through Christ Jesus' blood atonement for our sins, and it's by faith in that shed blood of Jehovah God that we are saved. Have you taken that blood by faith? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ, the Redeemer? Are you a member of the Jehovah Witness Secret Society, the Watchtower Society, and following Charles Russell, the great schemer who has lied and cheated and stole and deceived? I want to end our study with the testimony of the Bible against the Jehovah Witness movement. Again, 1 Timothy 4.1 tells us that in the last days, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. Mr. Charles Taze Russell left the Christian faith, became a skeptic, later claimed to come back, but if he came back, why didn't he stick with it? No, rather he went to the Templars and learned the occultism of masonry, and he started his own false religion, a secret society. And it sounds to me that he gave heed to seducing spirits and made doctrines of devils, not doctrines of Christ. The Bible says, holding fast the faithful word as it had been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. It's all about that sound doctrine. We're supposed to stick with that sound doctrine because there's people out there that say the opposite. But what the Bible says is true. Titus 1, 10 and 11 says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. What do Jehovah's Witnesses do? They go door to door. They go to your house to try to deceive you and recruit you into their cult. Ephesians 4.14 says, We should not be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The Jehovah's Witnesses are just lying in wait to deceive you with false doctrine. Peter says there are false, prophecies, uh, false prophets that come in that bring in damnable heresies. We need to stay away from that. 2 Peter 2.2 2 says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Unfortunately, many people have followed the Jehovah Witness movement. By reason of whom the way of the truth shall be evil spoken of. The Jehovah Witnesses speak evil of people that believe in the Trinity and the doctrine of salvation, that believe that Jesus Christ is God. 2 Peter 2.3, And through covetousness, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. What do they want? They're after your soul. They want to make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Psalms 9.17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell. But yet, the Jehovah Witnesses say, Man, we don't believe in hell. Well, there it is. They're going to go to a place that they don't even believe in. And they're taking people there with them with their false doctrine. It doesn't matter if you believe in hell or not. The Bible says it's real. Unless you get saved, you'll go there. Imagine. I was a Jehovah Witness. Why didn't anyone warn me about hell? Why? Well, I've warned you today. I've tried to show you what the Bible says. Whenever those Jehovah Witnesses come to your door, they might not say it, but if they are honest, they would say, Hi, would you like to join our cult and go to hell with us? They don't talk like that, but if they were honest... That's what they'd say. 
You see, it's all about this guy right here, Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby ye must be saved. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Behold God, that's Jehovah, is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in Christ. God is my Savior. He is my salvation. He's Jesus Christ. Is He your salvation? I'd like to close with the Gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Something you'll never hear from a Jehovah Witness, because they won't preach this. It says, Moreover, brother, I declare to you the Gospel by which you are saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. For I deliver unto you, first of all, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. It was Jesus, God, who died in my place for my sins. He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Unless you're Jehovah Witness, and then they say, no, He didn't rise again, not in that body. They even deny the Gospel. So the Gospel is that Jesus died in your place for your sins. He shed His sinless blood to forgive you of your sins. Have you trusted Him? Are you saved? Ephesians 2, 8, 9 say, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. you got to be saved. That's what the Bible teaches. Saved from what? Saved from hell. See, the Jehovah Witnesses say, Oh, there's no such thing as hell. What the Bible says there is. So what are they doing? They're deceiving people into going to this horrible, horrible place. This book here tells us these words. Charles Russell was raised as a Congregationalist, and because of his fear of hell, he rejected that doctrine. Oh, Charles Russell was so afraid of hell that he says, I'm going to make my own religion that teaches there is no hell. Where is Charles Russell today? He's burning in hell and screaming and crying. Charles Russell was so afraid of going to hell that he started his own society. Remember, it's not a church. It's a secret society, which he taught there was no such place as hell. And because of that, there's no need to be saved from it. That's what you call a liar and a deceiver. So the final question is, where will you spend eternity? Heaven or hell? Smoking or non-smoking? The decision entirely is yours. If you want heaven, come to the side of the Bible, come to the side of the truth. If you want to go to hell, follow a false religion, follow a cult like the Jehovah Witness the Watchtower Society. Here's the final word from Jehovah Himself. Isaiah 45, 21 and 22 says, There is no God else besides me, a just God and a Savior. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am Jehovah God. Look unto me, Jehovah, to be saved. The Jehovah Witnesses don't teach salvation. They don't want you to be saved. But where is salvation? Well, Jesus saves. You'll only find salvation in Jesus Christ. You know what's interesting? The word Jesus. Did you know the word Jesus is a compound word? If you take that word and divide it into two, which it is, two different words, it's Jesus. Je is short for Jehovah. Seus is saves. The word Jesus is Jehovah saves. The Jehovah Witnesses, all they want to do is talk about Jehovah but they won't even look at Jesus. For the Jesus is the way that Jehovah gave the world to be saved from hell. I appreciate you watching this. I hope it's been a blessing to you. I hope it's helped you. If Jehovah Witnesses come to your door, I hope it'll help you. I give them the verses to show them in order to be saved. They're deceived. They're in a cult. And their cult teaches that they can't even listen to anything that criticizes their false religion. They claim to believe the Bible, so if you could take them to the Scriptures, the King James Bible, and give them the truth, maybe they can be free. And who will set them free? Christ Jesus. And Christ shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Thank you again for watching. I hope this has been a blessing, and we'll see you next time. Always make sure to go to thecloudchurch.org and check out more sermons and preaching at thecloudchurch.org. God bless. Thank you for watching.